Hey everybody, it's Gomladax, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena. Today I'll be playing a sealed event of Battle for Baldur's Gate. This is the newest format on Arena. It will be the limited format primarily for the next couple months until the launch of Dominaria United. And this is going to be an Alchemy Horizons format. So this is a mixture of cards from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms from last year, Commander Legends 2 Battle for Baldur's Gate from just about a month ago, and a bunch of new alchemy cards. So it's a pretty explosive, pretty bomb-heavy format. It's a lot of kind of cool, unique things you can do in the format with the alchemy exclusive cards. And uh, yeah, it tends to be a pretty high level uh, format for limited. As you can see here, all of the different two color archetypes are made pretty clear in the little blurb they put on the sealed thing here. You have blue, white, flicker, blue, black, control, black, red, treasures, red, green, dragons, green, white, life gain, white, black, aristocrats, or white, black, sacrifice, uh, blue, red, dragons, black, green, reanimator, white, red, double team, and blue, green is another dragon archetype. So while the first Dungeons and Dragons set we got a bunch of dungeons, this time we get a lot of dragons and pretty cool format. Again, pretty balmy one. We'll see what we open up here and see if we can't build a pretty sweet seal deck for today. So it looks like we've opened up some very powerful rares here. I think the two best rares that we have are going to be Shadowheart, Sharon Cleric, a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two with Death Touch that specializes for only 2. However, you do have to have 13 or less life. Somebody has to have 13 or less life for it to specialize. Specialize is one of the new alchemy exclusive mechanics where you spend the specialized mana cost, discard a card, and you do that at sorcery speed to flip this card into a version based on whatever color the card you discarded is. So if you discard a black card or swamp, then you get Shadowheart, Cleric of Graves. You turn this into a 4-4 Death Touch Lifelinker that still deals the damage to each player during your end step. So I think the black version of this is the best one, but there are plenty of other ways you can specialize this to get uh, other bits of value going on. But Shadowheart is incredibly powerful. The front half of the card's already great, and... All of the versions you can specialize it into are super strong, so Shadow Heart's ridiculous. Wilson, another specialized card, another very powerful one, a 2 mana 2 to reach Trample Ward 2, already a great deal in Limited. And then as you can see, if you specialize with green cards, you turn this into a 5-5 five, five reach Trample Ward 2 that can exile from your graveyard to make another creature bigger. And of course, a different version for each color that's also quite powerful. So I think these are the two strongest cards we have, so I'd love to go black green if we can here. The third most powerful is probably Sworn to the Legion, a six-man enchantment when it enters the battlefield. Non-token creatures you control perpetually gain double team, and whenever you cast a creature spell, it perpetually gains double team. So that basically means pretty much any time you attack with a non-token creature, you're going to conjure a duplicate of that card into your hand. So it is going to be an exact duplicate. And then when you cast that duplicate, the duplicate will also get double team because you'll have Sworn to the Legion on the board still. So this card is obnoxiously good. If you're in a position where you can attack with any amount of creatures, even if you can only attack with one, it's just going to sit there accruing so much value as you just keep spamming out as many copies of your creatures as you can. Uh, after that, we have Ancient Silver Dragon, probably the fourth strongest rare, just because it is so expensive. It is an 8-8 flyer for 8, uh, but again, it is an 8-8 flyer, even if that is a lot of mana, which is pretty huge. The trigger when it deals combat damage to players is kind of hilarious. You could mill yourself with it, but most of the time, by the time you're swinging in with your 8 mana card, 8 damage should get your opponent pretty close to dead, so you don't mill yourself that often. And if you do, you kind of got the moral victory, even if you, uh, you lose out on a little bit of prizes. Then we have Wand of Orcus, probably being the weakest of the rares, but maybe but playable. A 3-mana equipment that costs 3-mana to equip is a really hefty upfront cost, so this has to do something really big for that to be worth it. And what it does is whenever equipped creature attacks or blocks, the equipped creature and all zombies you control gain death touch until end of turn, and whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you create that many 2-2 black zombies. So if you can get the damage through, that is huge, creating zombies equal to the damage dealt. However, it doesn't give any form of evasion. It does give death touch to disincentivize your opponent from blocking with a big creature, but they can always just block with something 
comparable in size to whatever you're attacking with. So Wand of Orca is going to take some work for it to work. So probably one of the weakest rares in here. And Baldur's Gate is going to be the last pick. You're not going to open enough gates in Sealed for this card to do much of anything, even in Draft. Uh, you're going to be going really deep to try to get this to do anything. This is very much a constructed plant. So pretty great rares here. Love, Wilson, Shadow Heart, Sworn to the Legion, and Ancient Silver Dragon Solid as well. So we'll have to see what we have in our general sealed pool. So as always in sealed, I like to check out our multicolored cards first, because similar to the rares, they're gonna be some of the strongest things you can do, and Lozan is no exception, a five mana four two flyer. It's not the greatest rate, but whenever you cast an adventure or dragon spell, you get to deal damage equal to that spell's mana value to any target that isn't a commander. So you can use this card as multiple removal spells. All of a sudden, any dragon or adventure you play gets to start dealing damage to your opponent's creatures or even to their face to finish them off. Lozan is an incredibly powerful card. Look at our colorless cards. Meteor Golem can fit into pretty much any deck. A 7-mana 3-3 three, three isn't a good deal, but you can destroy a non-land permanent in opponent controls when it enters the battlefield, making it 7-mana for a 3-3 three, three and a removal spell, and that kind, of, uh, that kind of makes up for it. Pretty solid card for any sealed deck for sure. Draft it might be a little slow, but sealed, you could pretty consistently make it to 7 where I'd play Meteor Golem and almost anything I end up playing, so I'm going to slap that in right now. And Prophetic Prism is similar, 2 mana for an artifact, when it enters the battlefield you draw a card, and then for 1 mana tap, add a mana of any color, I'd play this in pretty much any sealed deck and most draft decks. Very low cost to running this because it does replace itself the second you cast it, you just draw your next card from your library, and this just makes sure you're not going to have any mana issues that game, so Prophetic Prism is pretty nice as well. And then Iron Golems I'm not super high on because your 4 mana card is immediately going to be forced to trade into any of your opponent's 3 mana creatures, their 3 mana 3-3s three or 3 mana 4-2s or anything like that, because the Golem forces itself into combat all the time, you can't, uh, you can't choose not to send this thing in, so I'm not, not a big fan of Iron Golem. Lantern of Revealing is pretty cool, I would definitely play this if we're going to go for a 3 color sealed deck, it's probably okay in draft as well, but draft does tend to be a bit faster, but I think sealed is definitely slow enough for the 3 mana mana rock that taps for mana of any color that can also potentially scry or put lands from the top of your library into play. So I'm not going to immediately slap that in the deck, but going to keep that in mind. So we're going to go backwards in terms of what we look at the, the colors here, because I'm just kind of eyeballing the green at a quick glance here, and I'm very excited about it, because we have two owl bears. These are maybe the best green common in the format. They're definitely up there. Five mana for a 4-4 four, four trample that draws a card when it comes into play. Again, as I said with Prophetic Prism cards that replace themselves and draw a card the second they hit the board, always tend to be quite good. We also have Emerald Dragon, just a 6 mana 4-4 four, four flying trample, big game under there. It can also counter an activated or triggered ability, which can really come out of nowhere. You never want to have this and always keep up the mana for your dissident wave because you're like oh maybe they'll play some random activated or triggered ability but every now and then that'll just randomly come up and give you some extra value the vast majority of the time you're just playing this as a six mana four four flying trample and it's a fine deal there dread linorm is really nice it's going to give you a big seven drop that can really close out the game because it's hard to block and it's a seven six and it gives you a flexible little combat trick putting two plus one plus one counters on a creature untapping it and giving it hex proof so you can untap a creature so you have a blocker out of nowhere you can put two counters on a creature to have your creature become bigger than theirs during combat or you can give your creature hex proof to stop your opponent from casting a removal spell pretty flexible adventure there quite a nice card not a massive fan of you meet in a tavern. It's a little bit flexible, but I don't like the card draw effect on it. Look at the top five. Put any number of creatures from among them into your hand and the rest on the bottom. That will, on average, draw you slightly less. I guess, yeah, slightly less than 2.5 cards. Because most decks aren't going to be running 20 creatures. And if you're running 20 creatures, your deck is exactly half creatures. That'd be 2.5. So yeah, you meet in a tavern is like one or two creatures on average, which is not great. But sometimes you'll get three. And then giving your whole field plus two, plus two, but not giving any kind of trample or anything. Not that big at sorcery speed. Inspiring Bard is okay. It is a little flexible, but 
a four mana three three is not that exciting sylvan shepherd also not the greatest circle of mundra not the greatest but you need to put some kind of filler creatures in the deck so i'll probably play a couple of those if we go green what i what else i'm really excited about in green is double scaled nurturer a two mana mana ramp creature is quite nice especially with other dragons in the deck like emerald dragon where if we cast that off of this we'll gain two life or if we cast dreadlenorm off of this we'll also gain two life so double scaled nurture really nice mana ramp there Null Hunter is quite a solid 2-drop, but 2-mana two 2-2 two two that might get some plus and plus one counters later. Wilson, I've already said, is incredible. We also have a couple Arcane Archeries. These have been a pretty massive combat trick. Plus 3, plus 3, Reach and Trample is a pretty big buff, and then the next creature you cast is going to come in with a plus one plus one counter on it, Reach, and a Trample counter on it. So that's good if you have a more big creatures to cast. All of a sudden your Dread Linorm comes in as a 8-7 reach trample, something like that. So I'd run a one of in here for sure, maybe even two. Band together, one of the best green commons as well. Excellent green removal. Two creatures you control deal damage equal to their power to another creature. So really excellent green removal. Um, choose your weapons, okay. Don't think I'd main deck it, even though it is a little flexible. A little more flexible than just flying hate. So I probably do something like this as the green stuff i play maybe a poison the blade it's just a blade brand but green two mana to give something death touch line if you draw a card these cards are really just solid because they draw a card so if you're not in a position where you get any value from giving something death touch you can still just do it anyway to try to draw into something to to play next turn if you're just hurting for playable stuff um yeah, we don't have a lot of non-creature stuff, so if our second color doesn't have a lot, we can th throw that in here. But yeah, I mean, green looks really solid. I really like double scale Nurturer into getting out early owl bears. That seems like a pretty big game. We definitely have some filler stuff in here we'd like to cut out if we get some better stuff in our second color, like these inspiring bards. But yeah, I really like how the green looks. Taking a look at all of our black cards next, because that is where our strongest rares were. We had a Shadow Heart there and Wand of Orcus, although I probably won't play this card. And it looks like we have other really solid stuff in black. Summon Undead is going to be a solid card if we're in black green, because we will have the creatures that are big enough to, to be worth spending 5 mana to cast off this. If we spend 5 mana and play an Owl Bear, that's exactly on rate. If we spend 5 mana and get a Dread Linorm, we're living in Magical Christmas Land, but that could happen. We also have Grace Lad, which is good for the green-black self-mill strategy, letting us mill 4 cards, and then if we have enough creatures in Grave, this will be a 3 mana 4-1 Menace Death Touch as well. So I like that quite a bit. Don't like the Demogorgon's Clutchers, I wouldn't play that, but I do really like Sewer Plague as a removal spell that we gain access to by playing black. This is minus two, minus two at minimum, and then every upkeep from this point on, the creature's going to get another minus one, minus one. So you play this in your turn, pass to them, minus three, minus three, they pass to you, minus four, minus four. Skills pretty much anything, it just might take a little while to do it. Very good card. Not a huge fan of Thieves Tool, but I am an incredible fan of Viconia. She is insane. She's a 2-mana two 2-3 two, that specializes for 2. So again, that is at sorcery speed, and you discard a card. Whatever color the card is is what you specialize into. Uh, and with her, you're going to exile a creature from a graveyard for 1 mana. And when you specialize her, you get a duplicate of whatever you exiled from a grave into your hand. So you draw that creature into your hand, but you make it better. The black version of her is going to make the creature drain your opponent for two life, and the green version, if we go black green, is going to make that creature get plus two, plus two. And one of the really cool things you can do with her is if you don't have a turn three play, if you go into full control mode, then you can specialize. You can play Vaconia turn two, and then on turn three, specialize and discard a creature. Then in response, before your specialized trigger resolves, you can exile that creature from your graveyard, so then that creature is the creature you put into your hand. So you can specialize without even spending a card to do it, basically, if you don't have a turn three play. Usually it's best to save Vakoni for later once like your best threat or your opponent's best threat has died, but that is something to do if you have nothing to do on turn three. Shadow Heart, I've already said, is pretty incredible. Horde Robber's pretty filler. Guild Sworn Prowler... Actually looks kind of good, a 2-mana two 2-1 two death touch, and if it wasn't blocking when it dies, you draw a card. So if it dies while attacking, if it dies from 
a wrath effect or something like that you're drawing a card off of it and if you're just playing a two mana two one death touch and then blocking their three three or four four you're still happy with it even if you're not drawing a card out of it so that seems pretty good um grim wanderer it's a little bit narrow it's not always going to be cast but the times when it is it is two mana for a five three kind of a niche card but it's it's solid it's okay um, and then I don't love Chain Devil. There's just not a lot of great expendable creatures to be sacrificing to this. So I probably won't play that. Probably won't play Horde Robber, and I might not play Grim Wanderer. But if I'm going to play, be playing Summon Undead, I'll probably play a, a Baleful Beholder just to have some more late game stuff. This card's not the greatest. It's just a 6 mana, 6, 5. Maybe gives a little bit of mana most of the time. But every now and then it will be very good when your opponent is playing artifact and enchantment based removal and you get to blow up their minimus containment when you play this. That will be a great time. So let's see if we can do green black. I'll take a quick peek at the other colors, but green black really does seem like a great place to be with this deck. So I threw all the green cards that I had before in here and it looks like we can go green black and we have room to cut two more cards. So I'd probably cut a green wanderer, a grim wanderer, a green wanderer. And then uh, one of these two drops because we've got a lot of them. I guess I could cut the circle of the land druid, but my thinking there is that it would it would synergize well with gray slot and summon undead. That's not most of our deck. That's just a couple other cards. Yeah, we can cut the circle of the land druid and then the grim wanderer here and that would just be a deck. One thing I don't like about that is we would be main decking the Wand of Orcus, and this card doesn't seem great. We are Thank you very much to Loki Avenger for the follow. I am not live right now, I just always have the follow alerts on in this recording software. Um, what was I saying? Yeah, I don't love the Wand of Orcus. I might cut Wand of Orcus just to leave Grim Wanderer in. This card is, is fun looking though. Worst case scenario, we'll have some fun with it, see if it does anything. And it is powerful on an owl bear. If you can put Death Touch onto a Trampler, you're pretty much guaranteed to hit through. Because when you have Death Touch, lethal damage is just one damage. So if your opponent blocks your owl bear with two creatures, even if they block it with two 10-10s, if you have Death Touch and Trample, you get to deal one damage to both of their 10-10s and two damage to their face. So because I've got a, a little bit of trample in here, I'll, I'll keep the Wand of Orcus. We have Wilson, we have two Owl Bears, we have Arcane Archery potentially giving trample, so we have some ways to maybe Death Touch trample with the Wand to make sure we're getting some 2-2, two -two, so try that out. And then the deck would be 17 creatures, 6 non-creatures. Oh, I did cut the colorless cards though, so we actually get to cut more because we get to put a Meteor Golem in here as well as a Prophetic Prism if we want it. Don't think we actually need Prophetic Prism for this color pair, though, so I'll actually probably keep that out. Um, so throwing in a Meteor Golem, we get to cut one more of these two drops because we have so many of them. Maybe the Guild Swarm Prowler because we have solid removal. Do we have 18 creatures? Yeah, we'll cut another creature and cut another two mana one. I suppose I will cut the Guild Swarm Prowler most likely, just for curve reasons. Just have a Mountain at two here. I don't think we're that aggressive, actually. But we could cut like one Inspiring Bard or something, but I like having the curve to where we can curve out two mana card, three mana card, four mana card, five mana card a little more often. Yeah, I'll cut the Guild Swarm Prowler and we would call that a deck. Now that is probably what I'm going to roll with, so I'm going to go ahead and do what I often do, which is to just click done so that it saves the deck. And then now I get to look through my other colors, and if I still just want to play green-black, then I can just... Uh, leave deck building and make sure that it does not save the deck that I built. So we'll take a look. Our white does seem powerful as well. We have two minimus containments, which is fine. Again, there is main deckable enchantment removal in this format. Green has a lot of it and black has a little bit with those big um, beholders. So minimus containment does hurt a little bit in this format. There's also flicker cards in white and blue that can bounce your card and bring it back to the board which would make any enchantments fall off. So Minimus Containment, not as good as it used to be, but it's still fine, definitely goes in the deck and sealed. Um, Rasad is incredible. A 3-mana 2-2 that exiles an opposing creature until it leaves the battlefield, and it has specialized abilities that it doesn't even need to be good. But if you do specialize it on white, you're going to make it so when their creature comes back, it's only a 1-1. One, one. And then all kinds of other stuff if you choose different modes. 
Sea Tower Imprisonment, again, enchantment-based removal, so I'm not in love with it, but this one is a really, really good deal. It's a three for one. Off of this one card, you're going to lock down their creature. That's one bit of value you're getting. You're going to create a Soldier of the Watch, a 2-1 onto your board. And when that Soldier of the Watch attacks, because it has double team, you will put another copy of Soldiers of the Watch in your hand, which is going to be your third card that you get off of this one card. So Sea Tower Imprisonment is just insane. Um, there's Icewind Stalwart, one of those flicker cards, which is fine with Priest of Ancient Lore, but with just Priest of Ancient Lore, don't know if we'll main deck this. Put it in for now. Definitely would play Sworn to the Legion. That would be powerful. Our white does look pretty solid. Not a ton of white cards, but the ones we do have are solid. We have a gate to the Citadel. All of the gates are quite good. A land that comes into play taps, but gives you a guaranteed non-land card in the late game. Solid value there. See, I like white a decent bit. We could play You Hear Something on Watch. We could play some Ranger Squadrons. They'd probably be fine. Bunch of fine stuff there to fill it out, and then some really good stuff when we started off the white deck. We'll take a look at blue here, and then red, just so we've taken a peek at all of our colors. Make sure we're not missing anything monstrously powerful here. We, of course, do have that ancient silver dragon in blue. However, it does look like a lot of the blue cards are some filler stuff I am not nearly as excited about. Like Dream Fracture, it's kind of like a weirder cancel, maybe even a worse cancel. Three mana to counter a spell, but each player draws a card when you cast this, you and your opponent. Um, you find the Villain's Lair, it's just another counter target spell, but you get to draw two and discard two if you want instead, if there's nothing to counter. I don't love Irenicus's Vile Duplication, because you need to have a solid creature on the board to cast this, so it's a little bit narrow in that sense. It's a card that you could top deck in a lot of positions and be really unhappy with. When it is good, it will be really good, you know, if you're playing blue-green and you get to make a flying version of an owlbear, you'll be super happy, but you have to account for all the times that you draw this and your board is just two ones and one ones, or you really need to draw a creature and this is just not really a creature for you. Um, Charm Sleep is the worst of the enchantment-based removal spells, so I really don't like it here, because again, as I said before, I don't love enchantment removal in this set. Um, and then Invoker's really filler, Looter's really filler because it costs mana to do the looting, the Githzerai's are kind of filler, Conjurer's filler, a lot of filler in blue, just so we can kind of play our Ancient Silver Dragon, maybe a Sword Coast Serpent. This does seem powerful, 2 mana to bounce a creature to its hand, and then a 7 mana 6-6 six, six that can occasionally be unblockable. Blue seems fine, I don't want to hate on the blue too much. We've got definitely some... We've got a solid amount of filler at like all... Uh, we've got a solid amount of filler at all points of the curve. Just don't have that much explosively powerful stuff like we do with the black-green deck. And taking a look at red, we get another gate. I do love the gates. Not too much else here. Some solid stuff, but not enough. Definitely not enough creatures here. The ones that we have, I'm not very excited about. I do like Cobalt Warcaller in aggressive decks. That is pretty good. Um, I only like Incessant Provocation in red-black, where you can sacrifice stuff. Um, Two-handed axes. I don't actually know if this is any good. The Adventure makes it probably worth it. A two-mana trick to give Double Strike out of nowhere. And then the equipment is just bonus. I don't know about that one. Definitely Dragon's Fire is great removal, and then you come to Null Camp and you find some prisoners are both pretty pretty narrow, pretty unexciting cards. Improvised weaponry is just okay, not very exciting. Yeah, red is... There's almost nothing in red. There's some stuff. You know, we have Dragon Breath, Cobalt War Color, Red Dragon, and the Gate, but... Feels like less than any other color. So the biggest color that I'm missing out by playing Black Green is White. That I'm missing out on by playing black green is white. Um, and how is our black? Our black has Vaconia and Shadowheart, which I think single-handedly make it worth it to play black. We don't have a lot of mana fixing. We have one Prophetic Prism, none of our green mana dorks tap for a mana of any color, and none of our green cards can search out a land from our deck. So I'm not sure we have the mana fixing to want to try to do a three-color thing either. So I think I am going to stick with the initial build, and we'll check out the black-green deck one more time, make sure our lands are all beautiful, give the deck a name, a style, all of that stuff, and go over the deck for those who wanted to skip over deck building. 
All right, so here is a final look at the deck. This is going to be a Golgari mid-range kind of value pile. We have a lot of really powerful specialized cards. Wilson, Bear Comrade, Viconia, Nightsinger's Disciple, and Shadowheart, Sharon Cleric, which are great cards to be dropping on turn two that can just turn into win conditions later in the game as they get specialized. So having three of them is pretty incredible here. We also have a couple Scaled Nurtures to help ramp into our nice value plays. We have the Double Owl Bear in the middle of the game there that are quite nice, and a lot of big stuff to try to ramp into as well. A Baleful Beholder, an Emerald Dragon, Dread Linorm being the really big stuff, and then a Meteor Golem is also a solid, just big late game value play. Some pretty solid removal here. We have Band Together and Sewer Plague, and then a little bit of Tricks to use as removal, Poison the Blade and Arcane Archery. And then another potential bomb is Wand of Orcus. I think this is probably the weakest card in our deck, but what convinced me to potentially play it is that it is pretty cool if you can get this onto a Trampler, because then the Trampler will attack with Death Touch and Trample, making it really easy to chip in for at least a couple points of damage and get those zombie tokens. And then once you have, like, a zombie token or two that's where you get to start getting a lot of good value off the wand because you start looping it together pretty easily you just slap it onto another zombie and now you have a death touching 2-2 attacking in that they'll have to trade into something or you'll just get to make two more zombies so that's where the wand starts really going off the real downside of the wand the really hard part about it is spending six mana to do nothing initially three mana to play it and three to equip it before you even get your attack in and you could very well just attack and have your creature die and have to equip to another creature so doesn't seem like a very good card but it is a card that i'm going to try playing out with um playing around with because it does seem fun um but yeah that's pretty much uh Pretty much the whole deck should be a fun time, and uh, I am looking forward to uh, seeing how it does as we head into game one. All right, here we are in game one. It's a very rough keep because we don't have any black sources, but we only need one to do everything we have, and we can curve out turn three and turn four with a creature with our current hand. So I am going to keep it here. One swamp makes the hand pretty active. And without the Swamp, we still have plays set up until turn 5, as long as we draw any land by turn 4. Opponent is still deciding on their mulligan here, and they are going to keep. Let's drop our forest out onto the board. Let's see what happens here. Planes from our opponent, and we immediately draw the Swamp. Excellent draw for us. Blue-white from our opponent, that is the Flicker color pair. There's also a lot of Flyers in that color pair. And in Sealed, you're less likely to have a super synergistic deck and more likely to just be playing your two or three best colors. So we don't want to read in too far into what they might have here on blue-white. Tamora's Invoker is the first play a 1-3 that will keep our sylvan shepherd off their back for a bit but we still get to attack with it because it has vigilance and we gain life every time we attack with it we get to curve out with our inspiring bard and still attack him with a four power shepherd next turn get some damage in there Soul Knife Spy is the play from our opponent, so yeah, I definitely want to play Inspiring Bard or Sewer Plague here, because I really don't want that Soul Knife Spy to hit us. So I want to make sure we have the blockers to trade into it so they don't get the card draw off of it that they would get whenever it deals combat damage to a player. Gain 2, up to 22 here. Opponent has a lot of card draw going on, Soul Knife Spy drawing if it hits us, and Tamora's Invoker drawing if they get to 8 mana. But both of those things should probably not happen here. We have two blockers for the Soul Knife Spy, and they're only at 4 mana right now. They are going to send the Soul Knife Spy in. I think... I think I would rather trade my Inspiring Bard into that than my Sylvan Shepherd. 
Now they very well could have the one man adventure that gives indestructible to a card until end of turn, but it looks like they don't, so that is definitely good for us. But yeah, I think losing out on one point of power to get vigilance and some life gain going on is actually pretty nice here. I think it's worth it. That being said, one point of power is the difference between whether or not it gets to attack into the Tamora's Invoker profitably or not. But we have another Inspiring Bard coming up to buff again. And an Arcane Archery for a combat trick. Uh, so our opponent played Clement here, which is pretty disastrous. Every card in their hand now has plus one, plus one. And if they specialize this card, it's going to be a larger version that is going to give their next creature whatever ability it gets. So the white version would be lifelink, and the blue version, I believe, is going to be flying. Oh no, the blue version is going to be vigilance. It's going to seek three non-land permanents, put one in the hand and the rest into the library. Interesting. The blue version is definitely stronger, I think. They discard a card to draw one random non-land card of their choice out of three different choices. I'm actually real scared of the blue version of Clement. Priest of Ancient Lore, oof. As a 3-2 that gains life and draws a card. Yeah, Clement is an incredible card. A 2-mana two 2-2 two, two gives you... Gives multiple creatures plus one plus one. Permanently, even if we kill Clement. Yeah, turning Priest of Ancient Lore into a 3-mana three 3-2 three, gain a life draw card. Pretty great deal. And Steadfast Paladin into a 2-mana 3-3 three, three lifelink. Oh, yeah, this Clement has given us a very hard time. Um, now that Priest of Ancient Lore is already on the board, there's not much we can do about that. It's already gotten its value. So I think their best card to kill would be either Clement or Steadfast Paladin. Get rid of their 3-3 three, three lifelinker or get rid of their potential to draw some cards tutor for a card and get a 3-4 Vigilance, so I think I'm going to Sewer Plague here. That being said, I could do that at instant speed, so I can just pass right now. We might even be able to use Arcane Archery in combat instead. We are one mana away from making it to our six mana Dragon. Trying to use that to just have the biggest card on the board. Got an awkwardly high amount of non-creature cards here, though, with this hand. It's a big issue. We are falling behind on board. A lot of that's due to Clement's ability, though. If it weren't for Clement, we'd be facing down a 2-1 and a 2-2 there, and our 3-3 you could just keep everything under lock. If they want to specialize Clement here, what's really nice is you can really punish opponents for using a specialized ability if you have instant speed removal. So what we can do here is we can sewer play Clement in response and they will not get the specialized ability, but they'll still have had to have discarded that card. So I'm going to do that here. And this is why we wait on the sewer plague. Is that now we get them to discard an island and still lose Clements. If they have a counter spell here, though, that might not happen, but. For only a single blue mana, the only one I can think of would be counter unless I pay two, which I can currently afford. So Clement does go to the grave, and Clement is a 0-0 zero, zero in grave, so we never have to worry about it coming back. And do I trade into Steadfast Paladin here? If I trade into Steadfast Paladin and then I don't draw land, I am left with nothing on board. I want to trade for Steadfast Paladin pretty badly here, but I don't think I can take that risk of just trading into it and then not hitting land and be like, alright, I'll play a wand and do nothing. 
So this way, if we don't hit a land, we can still just play like Arcane Archery or something. Or Owlbear. Great draw. The, like the best non-land we could hit here. Since it will draw us a card and maybe get to that land. And it certainly does. There is our sixth land for Emerald Dragon. Or to play and equip the Wand. Either one. Could be a solid use of our six mana. Making the owl bear a death toucher that spits out zombies. That was our thought process when we put the Wand of Orcus in the deck. Is that well, it's actually solid with our tramplers. Well, this is gonna be some kind of combat trick. Um if it's you hear something on watch to give their whole board plus one plus one, then it's better to block like this, because then we still kill everything. However, if it's something that's going to save one creature, that's going to give one creature plus two plus two or something, then it would be better to block like... Uh, like this, so that they definitely lose the lifelinker, because if there's one creature they want to kill, it's going to be the 4-4 four, four trample here. I think I should play around you hear something on watch because that is the main combat trick I can think of right now. The other one is going to be just give a creature indestructible till end of turn, which this also plays fine around. They can save Priest, but Owlbear will survive. So this is only bad if it's specifically like plus two, plus two to one creature. Instead of plus one, plus one to the board or something like that. Or one creature gets indestructible. Well, it was the one that's bad for us. Because it draws them a card, too. Oh, no. Multiple tricks here. Well, we're going to run up into those tricks at some point regardless. They're always going to be available if we don't get them out of the way. At least there's no extra toughness added to the Paladin, so we still killed it. But that was pretty rough, all things considered. Just get our Emerald Dragon and hope they don't kill this one. And this time we are not going to block if they send in again. If they're threatening another combat trick, I'll just believe them. Because I get to play this Wand of Orcus and get four 2-2s two on the ground if I hit my opponent with my Emerald Dragon. So I really don't want to put this dragon at any risk. If it sticks around, we'll have a whole field to block with a turn from now. It is generic mana to equip. Yeah, three generic mana to equip, so do not need double black. Which is perfect. Really love if our opponent taps out for their Hippogriff, where they don't have the mana for any instant speed interaction to be worried about. Love this song, it's so jovial. We're gonna scry one and draw a card with the young blue dragon. A lot of adventures over there. Now they play a land, play the Hippogriff. only play we know they could do but they've got three hidden cards no don't you hold up three mana they could still have a you hear something on watch they're reading the dragon Did they get greedy and try to scry one draw into a land to play Hippogriff and the adventure? Or do they genuinely have something for three mana or less here? That's the question. I'm going to go for it. I probably shouldn't, because if they have you hear something on Watch the Dragon's Dead. But if they don't have it, we kind of win on the spot. Okay, they don't have it. I think that's pretty much just like we win. That's four two twos. Even if they kill Emerald Dragon now, we just start slapping the wand onto zombies and our, all of our zombies are death touch every time we attack. And we just got a four for one there. Four two twos to block with and attack with throughout this game. Well, I'm happy I just went for it there. I was definitely worried. So I guess it was the, the moderately greedy try to scry one draw card, hit a land so they can play the Hippogriff in the same turn. To be honest, that's the kind of play I make all the time, <laughs> so it's a fair play.
Definitely cool to see Wand of Orcus doing its thing with our only flying creature in the deck. At least I think. They're going to return one of the zombies or the dragon? They should probably return the dragon because Trample Death Touch means we do one damage to Air Cult Elemental and the rest to their face and make more zombies if they don't bounce this dragon. Yeah, they bounce the dragon. Uh, so we have an Arcane Archery, so we slap the Wand of Orcus onto a zombie, attack everybody, Arcane Archery, the one that has the wand on it, and get a million uh, zombies again. And just, just go nuts with this wand. This is actually incredible. I don't think I'm going to have another game where the wand does nearly as much as it's about to do this game. Death Touch Trample, we're going to make four more zombies. They're all going to have Death Touch every time we attack, and here's a Null Hunter that also has a plus one plus one counter, Reach, and Trample from that trick. That is eight zombies on board. Alright. Wand of Orcus coming in swinging after I said it was probably the worst card in our deck. Comes in swinging for the first victory. We are 1-0. Primarily thanks to that Wand of Orcus. Here we are in game two of our Baldur's Gate sealed. I don't like this hand at all. We're not actually playing anything till turn five. I mean, we can put a wand out, but nothing to put it on. But we have both of our colors. We can cycle a Poison the Blade to draw a card. It's a greedy keep, but I'm going to keep it. I probably don't mulligan as much as I should. I pretty much don't mulligan unless my mana is bad. And the mana is not that bad here. I am going to cycle this Poison the Blade first opportunity I get. That's not a creature, so I guess we're not cycling Poison the Blade. Drop this Wand of Orcus and pass the turn. The one time I hoped that our opponent was the slightly aggressive Boros deck with a 2-drop every game, so they could play a 2-mana creature and we just poison the blade to draw a card. Alright, white, red, black, and a prophetic prism, so they could be many colors here. It's a Priest of Ancient Lore from our opponent, and Inspiring Bard, well now we have a 4-drop to play, so we will. We will gain the 3-life from the Inspiring Bard, fine little filler creature. Lantern of Revealing. Okay, so our opponent is just probably just like five color all the best cards in their sealed pool because they definitely got the mana fixing. Prism and Lantern. We just got one Prism. Actually, we might have had a Lantern. I don't remember now that I think of it. But I don't think so. I think it was Meteor Golem Prophetic Prism pretty much. Pretty great draw, Shadowheart, the Sharon Cleric. Scary card. We have Scaled Nurture as well. Oh my god, Warriors of Tiamat is destructive here. 4-2 Haste, and when it attacks, they put a copy of it into their hand. Not only that, because of their removal, Mephit's Enthusiasm, it's a 5-2 Haste instead, and they get a copy of it into their hand. When a no blocks here, I'm going to use the zombies we get off of Wand of Orcus to block those, because they're just two toughness. So a single 2-2 zombie, and we're set for life. Yeah, Wand of Orcus just swings right back at that value they just got. We're getting three zombies here. Getting four? They're not even going to block with the priest. All right, four zombies it is. We're blocking all day long. Do I want to play Shadow Heart or Scaled Nurturer? Oh, they're just done. They don't want to see... The Wand of Orcus anymore. They are over it, 2-0 as we head into round 3. Wand of Orcus just, uh, just taking names. Here we are now in game 3 of our Baldur's Gate sealed event. This might be the best hand we've kept so far. Definitely better than round 2. Probably going to go for a turn 2 Null Hunter. I don't see a need to immediately flip Vaconia. And Vaconia kind of gets stronger the later the game is. Because then there will be more creatures to choose from to put into our hand with her. So we're probably just going to curve out Null Hunter into the Shepherd. Hold up our trick. If we don't use the trick, then we'll play Vaconia turn 4. 
against another blue-white deck here. Turn 3 Scouting Hawk, just a 1-1 one, one flyer here. Since they are on the play, they're unlikely to have less lands than us at any point. Send in for 2 player Shepherd. If they end up with less lands than us, they are in the color pair that can flicker that Scouting Hawk to get its Enter the Battlefield effect to trigger again later and pull out a planes from their deck. Snowborn Simulacra, they're just going to draw two cards here. This is basically two blue and X draw X cards, but if you wait till you have seven mana and X is five or more, you're going to draw five cards that are permanents on the board, plus put one of them onto the battlefield for free. It is a very powerful card. Next turn we'll have six mana up thanks to Scaled Nurturer, so we're only one away from casting the Dread Lenorm. So if I want to get some good value off of its adventure and still cast it as soon as possible, I should probably use the adventure next turn. Especially if I draw a land. Then I know I'll have the mana for Lenorm on turn six. All right, they're going to play the Shepherd. And a Steadfast Paladin. Play the better blockers here. I like attacking with all three of my creatures here. With our Adventure up, our Scale Deflection... They can't kill Vaconia, even if they double block her, and she's the only creature I'm that worried about. So we'll just attack all here. Alright, we can scale Deflection to win this fight. I'd honestly rather kill the Lifelinker than the 2-3. Although I guess the 2-3 gains some life whenever it attacks, but that's it. Okay, yeah, I'll kill the lifelinker. Make sure we have 5 toughness. And then we will pass the turn, and we are ready to cast Dread Lenorm next turn. There's our Null Hunter. And a Tamora's Invoker. Just getting as many blockers as they can on the board because they are taking quite the beating right now. Go ahead and pick up their Steadfast Paladin. And we've got an extra mana, so we may as well exile their sorcery just in case they can recur it, return it from their graveyard to hand. Alright, ooh, Baleful Beholder. Give our board Menace. That'll be big later. I don't think I want to do it right now. I think I do just want to cast the Linworm, because it can't be blocked by anything they have on board. Am I okay to let Vaconia die here? At this point, it's probably okay. Can they kill Vaconia and only lose one creature? Block with these three? I guess? I think I'm actually okay letting Vaconia die and we attack like this. I guess if they block their 2-3 and 1-3 onto the Sylvan Shepherd, they can kill that without losing a creature, but then they're taking a lot of damage. Or if they block Vaconia 
They have to block Fakoni with three creatures to kill her. Which means we're dealing damage elsewhere there as well. So they are going to do that. They're going to go for the uber block on Vaconia, and even there we can summon Undead and get Vaconia back later if we really need to. So we have four damage to deal where we want it. We'll kill the two, three. And then we'll play a giant Dreadlinorm, and then Baleful Beholder next turn, and then it'll hopefully be lethal in our next combat, because they're down to five already. And there's our seven, six that currently can't be blocked at all. They need creatures with more than three power. Horn of Valhalla. Equip the Null Hunter to make it big enough to... Oh. Well, they're just going to send a message here, fair enough. I'll just take it. I was going to say Horn of Valhalla, equip it to the Null Hunter so it's more than three power so it can block our Linorm. But then they're like, no, no, they want to send a message here. Oh my god. And uh, Wand of Orcus is really angry with how low I rated it initially, so it wanted to show up in case our opponent didn't scoop so that I could cast it and equip it to the Linorm that they can't block and just make seven tutus. <laughs> One of Orcus is very angry at me right now, but uh, that'll be three and oh as we head into round four. Here we are now in... Game four with a mono black hand this time, but it's got Wand of Orcus. And if the other rounds are anything to go by, cannot mulligan if we have Wand of Orcus. And as you can see, the Wand of Orcus, this is our uh, this is our lucky totem today. It is just if it shows up, we have to take that as a sign. So I'm playing Vaconia here, probably to immediately get shot down by removal, but I don't have any other plays to get something actually on the board. There is an argument for just sandbagging her and trying to save her till late game because of how powerful she can be. But I want to make sure I'm actively doing things getting this game started. Could be wrong, though. Young Red Dragon is going to create a treasure token with its adventure. They can cast it this turn now. But they're going to cast a Dragonborn Immolator instead. A 4-mana 2-4. Four. For 2-mana, it gets plus 1, plus 0 until end of turn. And when it dies, you notate its power, and you get a boon where your next creature gets plus X, plus O, where X is the power of your Immolator when it died. I'm just going to play an Inspiring Bard and gain some life, I think. Can't really currently block that Immolator. Because they can threaten to just... Buff it up. So they're going to hit us here. Uh-oh. When end of the battlefield, another non-token creature you control gains double team until end of turn. Whenever it attacks, conjure a duplicate of another non-token attacking... Alder is actually insane. That is completely busted. So when it enters the battlefield, you draw... Essentially, you draw another good creature card, because whatever creature you attack with this turn, and then every time it attacks, you also draw another good creature card. Okay, well, we're going to have a bad time. That's a guarantee. What do we want to do about it? We have five mana. Could summon undead and get a Vaconia in the worst case scenario. I could play a Scaled Nurture and equip a Wand to an Inspiring Bard for the future. Or just to kill their Unicorn. We force them into a block here, so we kill the Unicorn if we equip the Wand. I can't hold up the Arcane Archery if I play Scaled Nurturer. Or if I equip the Wand. So I think I'm going to Scaled Nurturer... I think we're just dead, is what's going on here, but I think Skill Nurture, Equip Bard, get rid of one of these creatures. 
Just get rid of the unicorn here. Oh my god. We're getting absolutely handed it today. Well, in this game. That is wild. The dueling rapier off the treasure token. Now Older just gets to go off. They're just gonna have infinite Dragonborn emulators in hand. Sewer Plague, get rid of Older. Seems like the best we can do. Three mana left after that, we can Arcane Archery after a block. That won't kill anything though if it's just Dragonborn Immolators left, but we need to kill Older right now before they draw any more cards off of it. I guess since I can't kill anything off blocks anyway, I might as well just equip the wand to the Nurturer just in case. So I'm not really going to block here. That way I could set up a play where I attack with the Nurture and then Arcane Archery to get three zombies to block with. Not that that's a good play, but it might be what we're like stuck with. Or we could use the Scale Deflection to get some zombies. Wow, no, they're gonna portable hole our 0-2. So they know no shenanigans are coming up. The lineup of answers here is just disgusting. Now... Inspiring Bard or Vraconia, worst case scenario, off of Summon Undead. Best case scenario, we have an Emerald Dragon Baleful Beholder in there. Owl Bears. Five mana, we can only do one thing this turn no matter what. Summon Undead is going to be equally comparable to our best play in hand, which is just a 3-3. So we Summon Undead, go for the RNG. Grace Lad. It's going to be a 4-1. Get a 4 1 or a 3 3. 4 1's actually better because we trade into an emulator. But I don't think it's good enough to come back from the phenomenal stuff that happened with their Duke. Older Ravenguard. Or Ravenguard. Now their next creature gets plus two plus O oh when they cast it. Young Red Dragon it is. As a 5-2 instead of a 3-2. Play Bard and gain three is the only way we survive another swing. Even then they equip that with the rapier, they get seven into our face no matter what. We block there and then they fire breathe. Yeah, they have lethal on board no matter what we do now. This was a rough one. Just some explosive stuff from our opponent's deck. One of the things I was saying early on, this format can be incredibly explosive. And all their answers just lined up perfectly. Dragon's Fire, the moment we played Vaconia. The Dueling Rapier to win that combat where we tried to get something done with Wand of Orcus and then Portable Hole. As soon as we were like, well, maybe we can have a backup plan of getting in with our O2? No, you can't have that either. All of the answers, three and one it'll be. Okay, here we are now in game five. Turn to Vaconia again. We can play Wilson instead, because Wilson's really good with the wand. And Wilson's hard for them to immediately kill. So we can save Vaconia as our late game way to get back into it and just start off with uh, with Wilson. I like that a lot. And now Circle of the Moon Druid get a 4-2 during our turn. Also pretty nasty with the Wand of Orcus. You can get four zombies off of it. So I can go Maximum Greed here and just cast the Wand. Is that worth it? Honestly, with a Trampler on the board, I genuinely think it is. 
to just cast the wand, and then even if they play a blocker next turn, we just slap the wand onto Wilson, kill whatever creature they play here, and get a 2-2 zombie. And if they don't play a creature, then we pop off, my friends. I guess it's only two zombies a turn, but it's two zombies right now, and pretty much guaranteed at least one next turn. Unless they double block Wilson, in which case we're killing two of their creatures because of Death Touch. Guild Swarm Prowler and a Horde Robber. So, yeah, we attack with Wilson, get another zombie here. All of our zombies attack with Death, death Touch, so we attack with all of them as well. Oh, you know what? I should have specialized Wilson. I could have made Wilson a 5-5 five, five here. I should have discarded Scaled Nurturer to specialize Wilson, and we would have handedly been winning this game. Just forgot about the specialize ability. Wilson turns into like a 5-5 five, five Trampler. Which is just absolute insanity. But we can still play an Owl Bear here, and then put the wand onto an Owl Bear, which is another Death Touch Trampler, to keep the wand popping off. The Hourglass Coven. That is actually incredibly good. Three three threes. All of two of which have really good abilities. Beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1. One, one. Beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1. One, one. So they just want to get a bunch of 1-1s. One, okay. Now we have a band together. That's a great draw. Equip Owlbear. We have band together at the ready. Send in everybody because they're all death touch. I think we still just kind of get there because Wand of Orcus is just insane. This is a card I would completely overlook in draft, but... Now that I've played it a bit and sealed, like, if you can get a Wand of Orcus, if you're, if you have evasive creatures like Flyers, it's nuts, or if you just have Tramplers, it's nuts too, because you get Death Touch Trample to guarantee you're, you're hitting them and getting more zombies. Wow, I'm, I'm glad I opened up that Wand of Orcus here, and I'm really glad I ended up running it. I was considering not doing it, but... Now that I'm just getting many games of incredible Wand of Orcus experiences, I'm uh, confident in saying I highly underestimated that card and I would be happy to draft it early and try to pick up a bunch of Owl Bears to go with it. And this is why early on in the format I like to try to play with all of the cards a little bit, even if I think they look pretty bad, because sometimes I'm very wrong and it's good to get experience with them. Not an excellent curve here. We're not playing any creatures till turn three, but we have both of our colors. Solid combat trick. Definitely need to get some more lands or ramp because we have a seven and a six here, but I'm going to keep it. Again, generally I don't mulligan hands with great mana, but as I said before, I probably mulligan a little less than I should when I'm looking at hands like this where it's like I don't have much action. I just have one creature and then I'm just doing nothing for a while, depending on what we draw. The ideal hand is one where you have the lands you need to get to most of your plays, and you have your plays lined up. You're like, all right, this is what I do turn two, this is what I do turn three, this is how I try to win the game. Those are like the excellent hands. Those don't happen very often, but when they do, you're always happy. So the ideal hand would have been if we already had scale nurture, because then we're like, all right, turn two nurture, turn three circle, and then our game plan is to use arcane archery to get rid of their creature when they try to block circle, and then end the game with like emerald dragon. So if we had this instead of meter golem, that is what I would call an ideal hand. That would have been beautiful. So drawing it immediately was fantastic. Playing against blue, green, and red with a lot of ramp if they're playing lapis orb of dragon kind, and that gives them some scry when they cast dragons with it. Eager Scholar is here. Let's see if they want to trade into our Circle of the Moon Druid. They do. Well, I don't, so I'm just going to do that. The main reason I'm doing that is because I have 
absolutely nothing else to do this turn, so I might as well save the Circle of the Moon Druid. And now when we cast our Emerald Dragon, it will be a 5-5 instead of a 4-4. It already has Flying and Trample, though, so the Reach Counter and the Trample Counter don't do much. Ooh, Battlecry Goblin. Powerful card, but not without uh, creatures alongside it. I'll trade my Circle of the Moon Druid into that. And they're cool with that trade, they just need to survive here. Gain a couple life, drop our big 5-5 five, five Flying Trample Dragon. Lozan, Dragon's Legacy, that is getting shot down instantaneously. That card is incredibly good. I guess we'll see if they chump block, it's highly unlikely, but... Yeah, we're going to Meteor Gold in that card. So I drafted a deck around this card on stream earlier today in this recording session. And this is, uh, this card is just insane with a good dragon deck. Because every time you cast a dragon, you get to use deal damage to any target equal to the mana value of the dragon you cast. So an excellent removal spell. Now we have Miram Sentinel Worm. Whenever another non-token dragon enters the battlefield under your control, create a token copy of it. So they play a young blue dragon, they get two dragons out. So we Inspiring Bard to hit for 7 here is the line, but now they have a 6-6 six, six Flyer that we can only get through for one attack right now, so we have to top deck something to find lethal. But we do get one attack in here. But that's explosive and incredibly bomby. But there are two life, maybe just we have a wide enough board now to just attack all get around their multiple dragons. We need them to only play two more creatures this turn. So if they don't have a follow-up to the young blue dragon, we have lethal. Attack with four creatures, they have three blockers. Just one at the top, one at the bottom. One green mana up. Looks like probably not another creature. Vaconia is an incredible draw. I should have checked if Viconia does anything right now. To see if I should Viconia pre-combat. But I don't think Viconia does. Let's see, do they have a way to gain life here for one mana? They do not, and we will hit for lethal. So let's check real fast. Should we have Viconia uh, pre-combat? Oh wait, no, it wouldn't matter. I, I didn't need to check because... Uh, in order to specialize, I have to discard a card, and I have no cards to discard, so it wouldn't have mattered, but... Um, we didn't have these in the grave, they just now died. We had a Circle of the Moon Druid, or we could take their Battlecry Goblin, but have no red mana. Yeah, so there's nothing that immediately impacts the board off Faconia, even if we could have immediately specialized. Here we are in round seven. We are five wins and one loss in. Pretty great run with this sealed deck so far. And a pretty excellent uh, hand to start off here. Ooh, our opponent might be trying to go very aggressive here, starting with a turn one Monk of the Open Hand that can get additional counters on it if they cast two spells in one turn. We'll start with our nice little Null Hunter. 2-2 two, two, that can get plus one, plus one counters later. Flaming Fist Officer is their next play. Uh, this will make the Flaming Fist Officer a 3-3, three, three, but I'm fine with that. If I can just get that 1-1 one, one off the board forever for now. And now we can just play a 4-1 Gray Slad, which I'm pretty fine with, because that gives us something to actually do this turn, rather than just sit here and mill ourselves or something like that. And the 4-1 can trade into the Flaming Fist Officer on blocks. Sea Tower Imprisonment, a absolutely phenomenal card. We talked about that in the deck building, but that thing is absolutely nuts. So I can still band together with the Gray Slad to kill this Flaming Fist Officer. We saw it in the future. Don't think I want to do that right now. Do I play Inspiring Bard and attack in with the Null Hunter, or do I just play Inspiring Bard, gain life, and pass? I 
think I'm going to gain life and pass here. I think we've got the long game pretty pretty set up here. We've got Owl Bear that's going to be a two for one. Baleful Beholder is even going to be a two for one here because it'll make them sacrifice their aura. All right, let's see your nasty combat tricks here. Make them have it. Rally maneuver. Yep, that is disgusting. I vomited in my mouth a little bit. And Steadfast Unicorn. Well, if we don't draw lands, we are out of this game. Um, I guess I'm just going to kill the Flaming Fist Officer while I still can. I am at 19. I have a little bit of time to hit the one land we need to just start slamming owl bears down. Yeah, I'm just going to do this while they're tapped out. Get rid of that Flaming Fist Officer. Down to 16. Oh my god, please, Arena. Um, we need the mana for the Owlbears badly enough that I think we're supposed to poison the blade just to draw a card and try to hit the land this turn. And if we do hit the land this turn, we drop Shepard as well. There we go. Perfect. And now if we hit another land, we actually just play Beholder before we play an Owlbear. That way we get two blockers up immediately. Uh, so they're going to use Steadfast Unicorn to trade up into the Shepherd, but I'm okay with that. I just need to survive. Steadfast Unicorn. You can only use the ability during your turn, but you can use it at instant speed. Okay, Owl Bear's the play now, right? Yeah, nothing great in the grave. Owl Bear it is. Arcane Archery is the draw. Starting to feel a little comfortable. Now they have to have an actual combat trick to kill our owl bear, And if they do, that's fine. We can summon undead. Manticore. Okay, I guess that does it too. There's the sixth mana. Now we save our gray slad, and it's a 4-1 menace death touch that we can start attacking with. Because now we're just getting hit by their flyer here. Yeah. I like Beholder here a lot. We're getting there. We're really stabilizing now. We're starting to play some really big stuff compared to what their very aggressive deck is capable of doing on average. I don't like how they're looking through their graveyard, though. They might have just drawn something big. It's going to give them some uh, graveyard recursion, some good value here. I'm not feeling comfortable yet. I'm still pretty low. Oh my god. Ascend from Avernus returns their entire graveyard to the board. All of their creatures, at least. Seven mana. Can only do one thing with seven mana. Can't really attack anymore. Just play another Owl Bear and see what we draw. That was horrible. Ascend to Avernus is for the four for one. Flaming Fist Dust Guard. And a Priest of Ancient Lore. The gas does not stop. Full nitrous, no breaks. Even a counter on the Monk of the Open Hand from double spelling. Just the Manticore. Steadfast Unicorn's becoming a really big problem because they just put four creatures on their board off of one card. I think I have to blow up Steadfast Unicorn instead of Manticore with my Meteor Golem. <laughs> Which seems really stupid, but I have an Arcane Archery to deal with the Manticore later. If I don't deal with Steadfast Unicorn, they currently have 7 mana. If they have 8, their whole board gets plus 2 power. 
which means I'll have four blockers and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three creatures get in. They all have plus two. They're all hitting for at least four. Or at least, yeah, at least four. I just die if I don't kill Unicorn. Because of the double pump, if they just go land double pump, we just die to Unicorn. <sighs> the answers never stop. Rescuer Chwinga puts the Steadfast Unicorn back into the hand to get recast here for one pump this turn, and then two next turn. It's actually nuts that that was the last card in their hand after top decking blind for a couple turns. I mean, I guess we're dead then. This was brutal. Here we are in round eight. We are five and two, two wins away from a seven win run and one loss away from being out of it. I'm gonna keep this hand. We've got Nurturer into Bard into Emerald Dragon. And it's okay if we can't play Vaconia turn two because she is powerful later in the game, bringing creatures into our hand from the graveyard. See if our opponent wants to bolt the bird here, I'd be very sad. Nope, they'll get a treasure off of their young red dragon. And they're just gonna run it out turn three. Get a 3-2 flyer that can't block. I'm sure our I'm sure our I'm sure our I still remember how to speak English, I promise. All right, so there's our inspiring bard. Start swinging back at them. Currently, we're winning the race because we gained three life off of our inspiring bard. Okay, so they're going to just conjure a duplicate of young red dragon to their hand and hit a little harder this turn. Ooh, we've got a Meteor Golem late game now. Dreadlorm does not give reach, does it? No. I don't know if I'm gonna hit for five here or just hold this up in case they try to use a removal spell. They're not going to though, because they're just gonna play Young Dragon, aren't they? I think I just use this to hit for five. I think if they had two mana, three damage to a creature removal, they would have killed Nurturer earlier. Or unless they just top decked it just now. One mana away from dropping an Emerald Dragon which would be incredible for us because it would block their young dr red dragons and attack in aggressively. Two mana away from Meteor Golem and one black mana away from Shadowheart or Vaconia. Both would be pretty powerful. Owlbear is their play for turn and we top deck a non-land which leaves us stuck with nothing to cast. Which is far from ideal. We might even have to hold Inspiring Bard back now, because if we attack, we hit them down to 10, but they crack back for 7. They are winning the race now. Down to 12. Another owl bear, very good. 
not a land for us. We can kill their flyer now, though. Reverse band togethered. So they cast a band together, choosing both of their owl bears to damage our inspiring bard, and we uh, responded with our own band together. So they only had one owl bear left on board. We've drawn the black source now, but it's probably too late. I mean, we do gain a life when we cast this dragon, and it can block their young red dragon. Maybe we get there. The life gain is definitely a really good cushion. I'm very happy with Skill Nurturer giving us a couple life there. We'll see. Band Together to stop their Band Together was also really good. That was a pretty lucky draw for us to have that in that exact at that exact timing. See what our opponent wants to do here. They know if we hit a land, we get to cast a Dread Lenorm and gain another two life and put a gigantic dragon on the ground. With Vaconia, it's going to cost two to cast her, one to exile, two to specialize. So one, two, three, four, five, and then we'll only have one mana left. So we can't really use Vaconia and cast something off of her immediately. What about Shadow Heart? We could play Shadow Heart and specialize to lifelink, discarding Summon Undead, I guess. That would be solid. It's a solid option. It costs us four mana to do. Then we have a 4-4 four, four lifelink on the board. If we hit another land, it's probably just Meteor Golem. But if we don't, I think it's Shadow Heart discard summon undead. Ooh, Scanos. Every time Scanos attacks, gives another creature uh, plus power equal to Scanos's power. So they attack with Scanos and the Young Red Dragon, and then uh, Scanos is uh, hitting for like a million. If they flip to red, what do they get? First strike. Ah, that is horrible. If they specialize to red, we're so gone. They attack with both, and they're both first striking. So we chump with Scaled Nurturer, which keeps us off the mana we need to get the Meteor Golem. Wow, yeah, that's horrible. Um, I guess I could summon Undead our Inspiring Bard. I'm no longer super happy about the Shadow Heart, because they're just going to flip a first striking Scano. So I guess we just needed the Meteor Golem mana right now, and without it, I don't think we actually have a great line. But Shadow Heart is probably the best we have. Unfortunately, I can't discard Meteor Golem to specialize just to get it engraved to our Summon Undead because it's not a colored card. You have to choose a color to specialize. It's a green version. Can't be blocked. Yeah, no, that's not what we want. We want lifelink. Maybe I discard Vaconia over Summon Undead because she's just going to be too much mana. And if she's not, then we can choose her off of the summon. But yeah, like the summon undead, we can get back our emerald dragon or a meteor golem or something if we're really lucky. We are in a world of pain, though. They just flip Scanos to red. Hopefully they have other things in their hand that they would rather do. Because, I mean, I think just flip Scanos to red and we're... Just out. We're just gone. I 
I guess not immediately, though. We only have to block one of the two if they spend the majority of their mana flipping Scanos to red. So we could actually block and try to keep Scale Nurture around to still have one last opportunity to draw into Meteor Golem, and then we attack for four and gain four life with Shadow Heart. I generally think that we chump block with Emerald Dragon if they flip Scanos, actually. Even though it's so instinctual to just chump block with Scaled Nurturer. Scaled Nurture is probably more important because we have a Meteor Golem available if we just hit one more land and keep our Scaled Nurture on board. So we would chump block the young Red Dragon with our Emerald Dragon rather than chump block the Scanos with our Scaled Nurturer. Arcane Archery for Trample. And just send in straight with Scanos. And now we have to block the Young Red Dragon with Emerald Dragon. We have to jump there. I don't have to block with Shadow Heart, but it would kill Scanos unless they can give it first strike out of nowhere, so it's probably worth it. Because our, our alternative is to block with Scaled Nurture, we have to block it with something, because otherwise we're currently taking 10. Getting trampled for 6. I think we have to go for the Shadow Heart block. It just feels really unsafe not to. Because we're going to 1 life. Please don't kill the Scaled Nurture, I swear to god. Okay. <laughs> They're eyeballing it. I'm like, get your eyes off of my Scaled Nurturer. Didn't have to land anyway. Now we're taking seven in the sky, and we can't get any life gain. We could gain a single life. We can gain a single life if I summon Undead uh, Shadow Heart, and we just have to hope gaining one life is enough. Or what do we do with Wilson? We just get a Menacer that can't attack right now, or we get a Trampler that it can't attack right now. Yeah, so our only line is Summon Undead to bring back our Shadow Heart, so we get a net gain of one life, and we're at eight. We take seven in the sky while we're at eight. See our Mills. We got an Owl Bear, but Shadow Heart's the only way we survive currently. All right, go to eight life. Fingers crossed. No extra damage in hand, opponent, please. That's a million extra damage in hand. That's Minxkaboo. One butt kicking foot. So, everyone form a line. We will stomp out evil. Those are some really brutal last couple games. Super rough draws in that one. Just one man away at pretty much all points from stabilizing really well. And then they had to get a Minskin Boo to really get the rubbins in the end. Then, uh, the big ascend to Avernus 4 for 1, being, bring back four creatures from Grave. Definitely a pretty swingy bomb heavy format for sure, but we got our own bombs we got to play around with. Wand of Orcus, the biggest overperformer of the day, I am sure. Our last couple rounds there, our, our losses were just uh, the divine retribution, just us getting to feel what our first few opponents felt when we were just Wand of Orcusing onto Owl Bears all day long. I am sure it was not a fun game of magic for our opponents earlier. Um, so, yeah, overall really liked this deck i don't think there were any massive glaring issues with the deck i just think sometimes uh I, I think the deck was really good it's just sometimes our opponent's decks were a little better which definitely happens um yeah super, super solid deck not much else to say really liked uh ramping into the big stuff it was a lot of fun and uh, really liked the Wand of Orcus. Scaled Nurture was incredible. Ramping up and sometimes gaining life was great. Vaconia underperformed a lot today. Um, that's probably just because of like the makeup of the deck and also just our draws. We never really curved out super, super well with Vaconia to recast stuff from Grave. Shadowheart was great the one time we did it. Wilson was okay. Um, 
yeah, band together, Sewer Plague, Arcane Archery, all that was great. Summon Undead was fine. Wand of Orcus was incredible. Not much else to say. Pretty fun time in the sealed event. Nice 5-3 run. Nothing to be unhappy about there. We get quite a few prizes here. 1,600 gems and three packs. Not bad. It is really hard to break even in sealed. You need a six win run or better. That's why I don't play a lot of sealed. Far prefer Premier Draft's prize out. Sealed is much more for players who really want to build their collection, and that's certainly not me. But a 5-3 run, that's a run I'm, I'm very happy with generally in terms of win rate for like Premier Draft, Traditional Draft, any of that. So I'll absolutely take it. Fun deck, fun games, solid run. But that is going to end today's video. As always, if you enjoyed this video and you would like to see more, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to let the YouTube algorithm know to send some more of these videos to yourself and others in your recommended feeds. And uh, once again, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.